My Christian life kind of goes hand in hand because for me, I don't have teammates. I don't have anyone that I can rely on when I'm in the ring. So it all depends on how we react when that pressure comes upon us. Do we run to our own resources to try and solve whatever we're facing? Or do we depend on God in the midst of it? Not many folks on the street know Bible stories anymore. If there's one that is more widely known than any other, it would be the story of David and Goliath. Fear is an emotion we are all familiar with. It can grip us at any time, but particularly when we feel threatened or overwhelmed. What do you do when a giant is threatening your life? How do you react? In this episode of the series, Issues of the Heart, Charles Price compares King David's faithful heart of courage with the fearful heart of King Saul. Although David was not immune to fear, when he faced the giant Goliath, he knew where his strength lay. His confidence was in the deliverance of his God. This is one of the most well-known biblical narratives, and it has many parallels for us as we look at whose resources we rely on in our own battles. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. And if you've got your Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of 1 Samuel and chapter 17. Let me remind you or inform you, if you're not here last week, that we began then to look at events in the life of David, David, the second king of Israel, but the most significant king of Israel, and began as a shepherd boy. And I'm calling it Issues of the Heart because the Old Testament says quite a lot about David's heart. When he wrote many of his Psalms, he speaks a lot about his heart. And so issues of the heart, and we talked last week about a complex heart, and I want to talk this week about what I'm going to call a courageous heart in the well-known story of David and Goliath. Not many folks on the street know Bible stories anymore, but I would guess that there's one that is more widely known than any other, it would be the story of David and Goliath. Martin Gladwell, who is the author of some fascinating books, some of you will have read, as I have, uh, Blink, What the Dog Saw, The Tipping Point, Outliers. His most recent book is called David and Goliath. It has little to do with the actual Bible story, but it's about why underdogs sometimes win. He talks about the hidden rules that determine the interaction of the weak with the strong and the powerful, with the dispossessed. And uh, we know this image of uh, David, the young, weak, dispossessed, killing the giant, Goliath, strong, expected to win. However, the principle may be epitomized by this story, but the place of this story in Scripture is not just to give us a moral to live by. This story is of enormous spiritual significance, which is why I'm looking at this morning, we're not just looking at a piece of Israel's history, fascinating though that might be, but we have in these verses lessons that you and I need to learn, need to live by, need to appreciate if we're going to experience what God intends for us. Now, this chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 17, gives two parallel stories that are brought into focus. One is of the demise of King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. And the other is the rise of King David who would be the new king of Israel. Both these men have been chosen by God for leadership. Both these men have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. 
Both these men experienced intimacy with God, and both of them demonstrated the power of God when they stepped out in obedience to him. But there the comparisons stop, and the contrasts begin. Because everything else in their lives is in striking opposition. We see the sun rising on David, and this chapter highlights that. We see the sun setting on Saul, and this chapter also highlights that. We see steady growth in one. We see steady decline in the other into disobedience and darkness. Saul had started well, and he could well have been all that David became. He had every advantage going for him physically. He's introduced in 1 Samuel chapter 9 as being an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. So if you met Saul before he was ever on track to become king, you thought, man, that's an impressive young man. Physically, he was. That's in chapter 9. Chapter 10 tells us how God changed Saul's heart. It tells us how the Spirit of God came on him in power. So Saul was a man of deep spiritual experience with God. Next, chapter 11 tells us how he became victorious in battle, how the people recognized him as God anointed, how they rallied around him as king, how he drew valiant men to himself whose hearts God had touched. The story has a great God-centered beginning. But the story of Saul is a tragic one. It's not a story of success, but a story of failure. It's not a story of victory, but a story of defeat. Samuel had already told Saul that his kingdom would not endure before we get into chapter 17. So Saul, at this stage, knew he was living on borrowed time. Saul didn't know that Samuel had been sent by God to Bethlehem to find his successor, and his successor was the eighth son in Jesse's family, the one that they had not even brought to be interviewed by Samuel because they so completely disregarded him as a possible potential as king. But he was the man God chose, and we talked about that last week. And I think we best understand Saul's demise over a promise that God made to Saul when he became king. Because in 1 Samuel 9 and verse 14, when Saul was anointed king, or about to be anointed king, God had said to Samuel, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him leader over my people Israel, listen to this, he will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people, and their cry has reached me. That is the unambiguous job description given to Saul by God. He will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. That's what his reign is going to accomplish. He had plenty of opportunity for that, because it tells us in chapter 13, verse 1, that Saul was on the throne for 40 years. And in chapter 14, verse 52, it says, all the days of Saul there was bitter war with the Philistines. So for 40 years on the throne, constant war with the Philistines, and he never, never experienced what God had told him would be the purpose of his reign, to deliver Israel from the Philistines. There are three occasions in his reign when we have details about battles that Saul had with the Philistines. This is one of them here in chapter 17. Begins in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokar in Judah. Now I just want to ask the question who are these Philistines? Because they figure very highly uh, in this part of the Old Testament scriptures. When Israel conquered Canaan under Joshua, they had to deal with seven inhabiting nations who were already there. The Philistines were not one of them. The Philistines at that stage were living on the northeast coast of Egypt because when the Israelites left Egypt, Moses was told that when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter, 
But God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. That's in Exodus chapter 13. So the Philistines were on the Egypt side of the Red Sea at that stage. They had crossed the Mediterranean probably from Crete. There's some debate about the origin of the Philistines. They had settled on the northeast coast of Egypt near the Fertile Crescent. But now, 40 years after Joshua has occupied the land, the book of Judges opens up, and the Philistines have become the prime enemy of Israel. They've taken advantage of the instability created by the occupation of Canaan by the Israelites and tried to move up in their slipstream during that period of instability and occupy the land for themselves. That was their intention. And therefore, as enemies of Israel, they were enemies of God's purpose for that nation to be settled there in that land. And so every time they appear in the book of Judges and 1 Samuel, they are always constantly fighting. It seems to have been inbred within them. We're given a record of three battles in which Saul engaged the Philistines. One was in a place called Geba in chapter 13 and 14. One is in the valley of Elah. One is in Mount Gilboa in chapter 28 to chapter 31. In each battle, there was one constant characteristic of Saul. And the characteristic was fear. In Geba, chapter 13 and verse 5, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of beth Avon. And when the men of Israel saw their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks, in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan, the land of Gilead. In other words, they ran away and saw him into Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. So here's Saul and his troops quaking with fear as the Philistines threatened them. I'll come back to that. In the Valley of Elah, verse 11 of chapter 17, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. In verse 24, when the Israelites saw the man, they all ran away from him in great fear. It says, the fear and terror that Goliath instilled into them. In chapter 28, verse 5, of Mount Gilboa, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid terror filled his heart. So the characteristic of Saul, every time they're in battle with the Philistines, is fear and terror. Now, what is fear? I suggest to you, fear is an emotion that we experience when we're faced with something threatening us that is bigger and more powerful than we are and our resources. And when something threatens us and it's bigger than us, and bigger than our resources, the inevitable result is fear. I think one of the times I was probably most afraid in my whole life was uh, many years ago now, my first visit to India, about 35 years ago now. I was in the Nilgiri Hills of South India speaking at a conference there. And the conference grounds was located in what they claimed to be the largest game reserve in the world. What that meant was not that there were big fences around it and you had to pay to go in. It meant that the wildlife was free over a large area to live and exist and were protected and so on. And when I got there, they told me stories about elephants in particular and the danger of elephants and people being killed by elephants. One day, I was taking a walk at the side of a river that ran by the property um, just walking along, chewing over something I was going to be speaking on. Actually, I often walk and just preach to myself. And uh, there was, there was uh, trees on one side, forest on one side. And I was following this path by the side of the river. And I came round a corner. As I came round the corner, there I found myself face to face with a huge female elephant. Pro probably as far away as that wall from me. And when I saw it, my heart seemed to stop. <laughs> the elephant looked up, 
Its ears went out, its trunk went up. I knew that was a danger <laughs> sign. My feet seemed to just freeze to the floor. And without any premeditation, I just instinctively left the path, jumped into the river, and swam across the other side. But remember, there were crocodiles in the river. <laughs> but I got across the other side, got up, looked back, and this elephant got such a shock with me jumping into the river, it had turned its big body around and was running. I saw the end of it running down the path and broken a few branches off on its way, which became my evidence of what had happened. So I went back to the base. I told them what had happened, and they gave me a nickname, a Hindi nickname, which meant the one of whom elephants are afraid. <laughs> That one Sunday, I was speaking in a church not far away, and they gave me that name. They said, this is the one of whom elephants are afraid. And there were kids there with eyes the size of saucers, you know. I walked up to the platform. <laughs> well, I don't know about the elephant. I was terrified. Why well, was I terrified? Because that's bigger than me. It's stronger than me. I knew I couldn't get that elephant by the trunk. And so I'd get it over my shoulder and give it a karate chop and tie its trunk in a knot and kick it into the river. I knew if... That elephant got me, it would pick me up in his trunk, throw me in the air, catch me on its tusk, pull me off, throw me up again, catch me on the tusk, pull me off, throw me up again, put me on the ground, turn around and sit on me. <laughs> and I knew I wouldn't be very safe after that. When we face a crisis in our life, it exposes what we believe. David had spent a lot of time alone as a shepherd, seeing God deliver him from the attacks of wild animals. So when he met a far greater challenge, like Goliath, he had a history of faith and trust in God. We learn to trust God in the little things when no one is looking, in the privacy of our heart. Are we faithful in those small things at work and at home? They build our courage for the big thing God may ask of us. Mandy Bougeau is one of Canada's foremost female boxers and athletes. This 10-time Canadian national champion, two-time Pan Am gold medalist, and a Commonwealth Games bronze medalist, is a confident, formidable opponent in the ring. The second I walked into the boxing gym, I fell in love with it, and it was literally all I wanted to do at that point in my life. And one thing led to another, and I started competing. My Christian life um, kind of goes hand in hand because for me, I don't have teammates. I don't have anyone that I can rely on when I'm in the ring. So I rely on my relationship with God and that's where I draw my strength from. So I think the more I'm training, the, the bigger the event, the stronger my relationship gets. I'm, I'm not getting in there because of my own strength. I'm getting in there because I have this, this strength and this belief in, in something bigger than myself. one gold in one of the qualifiers, and then went to Mexico, and I had the opportunity to make history there. So it was really exciting. I, I actually boxed in the very first women's bout to take place at this major games, and then went on to win gold for Canada. I started to focus on the 2016 games. So on the way there, I, I did go to the Commonwealth Games, um, and I got a bronze medal there. And then the next Pan Am Games were in Toronto, in the 2015 games. I went to the qualifier in uh, March and I finished with a gold medal. It also set me up to be uh, a medal favorite. Like the Olympics is the ultimate dream for every athlete. Getting ready for Rio was, was a dream and it was um, something that I had uh, worked for for 13 years. So. Mandy was prepared physically, psychologically, and spiritually. Mandy Bajot, Olympic hopeful, gold medal contender, fighter, was about to have her faith tested. Going into Rio, obviously being an Olympic hopeful, um, you know, the first time stepping out in the Olympic arena, you know, hearing your name being called, and it's just kind of like everything coming together. The night before my um, quarterfinal fight, everything was prepared, I had made weight, um, I had like a light snack, Everything was good and I go to bed that night and then at one point I just got up and I got sick. Tried to go back to bed, 
same thing about you know 45 minutes later I get up again and I got sick and obviously I'm praying and I actually remember um, sending my mom a text message and I told her like right away to pray for me because that's kind of like what we what we do <laughs> and um, you know I go back to bed and then again I got up and I got sick and there was like a clinic with Canadian doctors and they were kind of on call. So they came in right away. Um, they started giving me different prescriptions, different things to try to like get rid of this um, sickness that I had. So I tried to sleep as much as I could. And uh, when I got up to weigh in, I had lost about five pounds overnight in about five hours. I was fighting at 11 at 9.50. I got the intravenous taken out and I biked over to the venue. Um, and then the next thing I knew, I had these gloves on um, because I was going one minute at a time. But I've never felt like this where, you know, I just, all of my energy was gone. And I was, and I was frustrated. And, then, you know, when we talk about, like, did your um, faith waver? And of course, yeah, it did, because I'm thinking, why would this happen? Like I had this this dream and I felt like the entire time everything that I was working towards it's like I knew that God's plan was working and this was what I was supposed to be doing. Mandy lost the goal but not her faith. With a courageous heart she remains determined finding comfort in prayer, strength in Christ. Mandy continues to fight the good fight. This one moment doesn't define me, right? I'm a 10-time Canadian champion, a Pan Am Games gold medalist. I've been able to travel to over 35 countries now representing Canada. Um, I've met so many amazing people through the sport and I've done things that I would have never been able to do if it wasn't for um, the sport. I think for any athlete um, who's watching, who has that, that walk with, with God already, is just really to trust your faith when you need to just pray or read your Bible or do what it is that you need to do um, to strengthen your faith because if you have faith, it's just, it's just so strong and it's something that is just um, gonna make you unstoppable as an athlete. On the other hand, I met another wild animal on another occasion. It actually was in New Zealand. I was in a home. We'd come back at the end of a meeting, been speaking, and I was staying in this home, and, and the husband, the wife, and myself, we were, we were talking, having a cup of tea or something, when suddenly the lady of the house shrieked, and she jumped up onto the seat she was sitting on. We followed the direction of her eyes, and peeping out from behind the piano was a mouse. Her husband and I had so much fun the next hour or so trying to catch that mouse. We moved it about every piece of furniture we could, and eventually we, we got the mouse, and, dee, 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 and we put it outside. Why wasn't I scared of the mouse? It's a wild animal. I mean, mice can kill you. That lady could have fallen off the chair and broken her neck. <laughs> I wasn't scared of the mouse. I was scared of the elephant because the elephant was bigger than me, bigger than my resources. I wasn't scared of the mouse because mouse... Come as close as you want. Go on, a little bit closer. That's it. Got you. <laughs> Why was Saul afraid? Because as far as he was concerned, when he met the army in Geba, he had only 3,000 men. They had 3,000 chariots and 6,000 charioteers and soldiers, numerous, as the sand on the seashore, it says, he counted his men, 3,000, he counted theirs, one does he, 3,000 chariots, twice as many charioteers, plus thousands of soldiers. He did the math, and he said, we can't do this. And he was overcome with fear. The fact God had made a promise to Saul was totally irrelevant to his thinking. God had said, you will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. Understand that, Saul? That is your job description. That is what's going to happen. And I, God, will do it through you. Because he was told that. He was told later, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. You're not a lone ranger out there, Saul, doing this. You're doing this together with me. We sang songs about that this morning. We sang songs about every high thing must come down. 
You are aware the victor's crown, you overcome. You know, the, we sang two of them actually that were like that. Right on target for what I wanted to say. And I can imagine Saul going out, humming the, a song like that. You don't know what you believe by what you sing. You know what you believe by what happens when you face the crisis. And Saul panicked, turned away, and if it was the numerical strength of the Philistines that frightened him in chapter 13, it was the bigness of one man in chapter 17 because when he faced Goliath in the valley of Elah, He was a giant. The NIV puts down he was nine feet tall. There is some ambiguity about that. The Septuagint, a Greek version of the Old Testament, puts him at six foot five, but either way, he was a big man. And as Glaster out of his camp, he put this novel idea, he said, all you Israelites fighting all of us, and every night we stop fighting, we go back, we bury our dead, we patch up our wounded, we have some dinner, we go to sleep, we get up the next morning, we come in the valley, we fight again all day, at the end of the day we stop, we go back home, bury the dead, patch up the wound. Instead of doing that every day, let's have one person from your side fight one person from our side. And if the person on your side wins, we will serve you. If the person on our side wins, you will serve us. Novel way to fight a war, isn't it? Just put two people in a boxing ring and let them sort it out and accept the verdict. Well, for some reason, Saul accepted the challenge. And then Goliath said, I'm fighting for the Philistines. Who's fighting for you? There's one obvious person, Saul. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. That's one reason. At least he could look him in the navel. He was the tallest man they had. And secondly, he was the obvious person because God made a promise to him. You will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. Saul, here it is, on a plate. God has promised it. Just do it. But on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Terror filled his soul. For 40 days, every day, Goliath would step out of the Philistine camp and say, where's your man? Every day, the same feeble response came back. Just, 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 just wait a minute. Just, just, just trying to sort it out. Ha, ha, hang on. Meanwhile, Saul was busy behind the scenes. He offered reward to anybody who would go and fight him. He started by offering great wealth to the man who kills him. Well, that may have been attractive until you realize what happens if I lose. <laughs> you can have an expensive funeral, but that's about all. So then he offered his daughter in marriage. We don't know what kind of prospect that was. But at least you would have been brought into the royal family and you'd have a lot of connections and a lot of privileges, but nobody took it up. And then he not only offered great wealth and his daughter in marriage, but he said he would exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel for the rest of their days. I'm sure a lot of families pricked up their ears. Wow, the whole family would be tax free for the rest of their days? They probably got hold of some weed in the family and said, why don't you go? Go on, you, you go and do it. If you get killed, at least we'll be free of taxes. <laughs> but there were no takers. And it was at this point that David came on the scene, sent by his father, still a shepherd boy. This bread and cheese and barley for his brothers, and he heard the silence of the armies, and he talked to one of the soldiers. And then he went and talked to his brother Eliab and said, What is going on? Well, we've got a problem. Yeah, I just heard that from the soldier. Why is it a problem? Because it's Goliath. Yeah, I know I heard that, but why is it a problem? Because he's big. I, I know that, but why is it a problem? Isn't God on your side? David, don't be so spiritual. You've got to be practical about these things. And they kicked him out, and he went to Saul. Saul knew David, not much about him, but David used to play his harp for Saul, and Saul was depressed. But he obviously didn't know much about him, because at the end of this, he says, who is this? Tell me about him. 
but he used to play for Saul, so he had some kind of access, and he went to, to Saul's tent and said, uh, why is there no fighting? Well, we have a problem. Yeah, I just heard about that from the soldiers, from my brother. Yeah, but um, Goliath's big and he's strong. And I know, I know all that. Isn't God on our side? You know, David, it's lovely to see the enthusiasm of youth. But you'll get over it. David said this. Nobody else will go. I will go. And in verse 33, Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. David said to Saul, and this is very important, listen carefully, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued its sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. What's David saying there? He's saying this. Saul, I have already proved God with no audience, nobody watching, alone on the hillside with my sheep. When a lion came, I killed it. He says, in fact, he struck it with his own hands seized it by the hair, struck it and killed it. When a bear came and took another sheep, I killed that one too. I'm sure David's father, Jesse, said to him many times, David, if ever a bear comes or ever a lion comes when you're out with the sheep, don't run anything silly, just bring the sheep home. But David knew that if a lion gets a sheep today, it'll be back for another one tomorrow. It's like... Fox we used to have chickens when I was a kid, and if a fox got a chicken last night, he'd be back the next night. And David, his spirit was this. If I'm going to be a shepherd, I'm going to be a good shepherd. If I'm going to be a good shepherd, no lion will get my sheep, and no bear will get my sheep. And the God who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. Do you know why we're powerless in big things? It's because we never trust God in the little things. We do not leapfrog into spiritual maturity. We do not suddenly get into a public domain and suddenly we have faith. No. You prove God when there's nobody looking, when there's nobody watching. There's no record to be taken of it. You just trust in God. It, you know, the, the many of us who find it very easy to live a kind of fraudulent life where one thing out on front, but we, we don't have the, the hinterland, the background of dealing with God. Sometimes we fail, but we come back in deep repentance and cleansing, and God will give you opportunity to prove him again in that area, in those areas. If we were to look more at Saul's story, which we don't have time to, you'll see that Saul disobeyed in the little things. He cut corners in the little things, and when faced with the big crisis, was totally at his wit's end, totally powerless. I'm not suggesting a lion is a lesser thing than a giant, actually, or a bear is a lesser thing than a giant, but it's of lesser importance, of lesser significance. It's just sheep, after all. But it's what goes on in the secret area, what goes on in your work life, behind doors, that either weakens you in your big picture life. The heart is the action center of our lives. It governs our character, 
It's where we feel, dream, and decide. This series, Issues of the Heart, examines the story of David and drills down to study the internal conflict within our hearts, the battle between the flesh and the spirit. This series by Charles Price is available on CD and DVD. Learn at home, give to a friend, or plan a group Bible study. To order this series, write to the address on your screen or call toll-free 1-888-269-6085. To order online, visit livingtruth.ca or simply text BY to our toll-free number. Through challenges and triumphs, God knows our heart. It is easy for us to become a Saul. He started out so well, chosen by God, anointed by the Holy Spirit, experiencing God's power in battle. But somewhere along the way, he forgot that it was God's promise to deliver him that made him powerful. We can forget where our strength lies and begin to operate from our own resources. We can have all the right spiritual language, but no longer have the substance of a relationship with God. Then we make decisions based on fear and are no longer willing to take risks for God. At the same time, we can be a David and step out in faith. We can confront those things that seem too big for us, confident that God is far greater than the giant we are facing. It's a challenge, but we can inspire those around us to do the same. And Saul tried to dress David in his own armor, which of course was too big. He didn't need it. He collected five stones. And in verse 40, if I read this bit again, verse 40, he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bare in front of him, kept coming close to David. He looked David over and saw he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to him, am I a dog? He caught me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed him by his gods. And I was, what, what is this? What is this? Your best soldiers won't face me. Uh, and, and you're just a, a kid, just a teenager. You're a shepherd boy. What have you got in your hand? You've got a sling, that's all. Come here, he said, verse 44, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. The Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know us not by sword or spear that the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Goliath. Did you understand that? It's not about swords and spears. It's about God. It wasn't that he just throw you stone anywhere and God will guide it so it'll hit him in the forehead. No. No, he's a good slingshot. And he took it, hit him in the forehead. Nothing like that had ever entered Goliath's head before. <laughs> and he fell to the ground. At last, the Philistine was defeated. At last, the nation now was victorious. And I finish with this. You see, you may live as a Saul. I may live as a Saul or live as a David. As a Saul called by God, a history of experiencing God. The Spirit of God has been on you. You have testimony of his presence, his goodness, his working. But you're living by your own wits and by your own resources. Yes, we still speak the language of godliness. You know, when David went 
Saul said to him in verse 37, go and the Lord be with you. What empty trash. If Saul believed that, go and the Lord be with you, if he believed that, he would have gone himself. You know, we can self-deceive with spiritual jargon because we learn to say all the right things. You know, this was just jargon that he learned. You can learn jargon in Sunday school and carry it all your life, and it is totally devoid of reality. You can learn language you use in conversation. It has no relationship to your life in private. And Saul had become this empty shell, devoid of godliness, but retaining all the trappings of his relation with God, all the language of it, but no substance anymore. And you and I can be a soul very easy. It's like a centrifugal force pulling us away all the time from the centrality of Christ. And the biggest enemy of Christ is Christianity when we adopt Christianity as a substitute for Christ himself. When we depersonalize our Christian lives, we talk about our, you know, our faith life. Don't talk about your faith life. Your Christ life. That's just a, a vague, empty phrase. It's personal. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself who we are to experience and be united with. But if, if we can be a Saul on the one hand, we can be a David on the other and for David, it meant to take risks in stepping out in confidence that God has given him what to do and God is bigger than every obstacle and bigger than every barrier and step out with the courage that God will give him into our hands. He doesn't reason with Goliath. Well, Goliath, you know, I, 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 I'm pretty good with this sling, you know. I've, well, I've killed about 25 animals in the last three months with this thing. Don't, don't you belittle my sling. He says, that. he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. This day, he will give you into our hands. That's where his confidence lay. And David stepping out in that obedience and trust became the one who gained victory. And finally, two things happened to David. Natural things that will happen in these situations. First of all, people joined him because in verse 51, David ran, stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword, drew it from the scabbard. After he had killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. And when the Philistine saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron, the dead were strewn along the Sharim road to Gath and Ekron. Isn't that interesting? Suddenly the men of Israel and Judah, whole crowd on, they surged forward and chased the defeating Philistines. For 40 days they've been intimidated by them and afraid. But probably in their fear, and we all have fears, we don't want to be the first, we want to step out on a limb, but when somebody did, when David had the courage to do so, other people joined him. And when you live in dependence on God and begin to see the victories and strength and presence of God in your life, people will join you. They will, because they're hungry for it. That's why some of the best things are caught, not taught. You can teach them, but unless... I can see it and get caught in with it. So that's the first thing that happened to David, and that's another aspect of story. It's another spiritual principle, actually. Don't criticize the people who, you know, you think are not doing the job. Do the job. Now, those amongst them who will join you. But the second thing, again, inevitable, someone hated him for it. Saul hated him. What happens to a man who should trust God but doesn't, when someone else comes along who does obey God, who does trust God, and especially if they're younger. Think Saul was delighted? Think Saul called in, then, David, fantastic, you've saved the nation, thank you so much. 
You don't know human nature if you think that. Saul was not delighted at all. In chapter 18 and verse 8, Saul was very angry. While they were singing a song, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. That didn't help. But he became angry. Now in that, in verse 9, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Notice that. Down in verse 15 of chapter 18. It says there, when Saul saw how successful David was, he was afraid of him. So his anger was turned to jealousy, now it turns to fear. In verse 29, when Saul realized the Lord was with David, his daughter Micah loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and remained his enemy the rest of his days. Chapter 19, verse 1, Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. And David would be in trouble living as a fugitive for something like 12 or 13 years after this. And Saul hated him. And you know, when we live in the flesh, Christian, but we live by human resources, we live in the flesh, we live simply by our own abilities, instead of in the spirit, we will find ourselves having a thorough dislike of people who live by the Spirit. And we may not be smart enough to understand why. Because the Spirit of God exposes the emptiness of our flesh. Dave will be for years in trouble, on the run, and we'll be looking at some of those troubled years in time to come, because he was willing to trust God and let God be God but Saul wouldn't. And so I ask you as I close, which is a more likely picture of you, Saul or David? We know the language. We even try to live the life. We don't know God for himself experientially, day by day, living in, basking in his love. We love him because he loves us enjoying his presence, relating every situation to him. Lord, this situation you've given me, I thank you, I can trust you, and I look to you. And whether it's in your family, in your business, in your church life, it doesn't matter. This is not a category that only fits one part of our lives. And we let God be God. We're going to pray together. Lord, I acknowledge before you this morning that it's so easy to get lost within spiritual things, within godly language, within Christian responsibilities and work. We relate far better to the circumstances around us than we do to your presence within us. We're more intimidated by our circumstances than we are freed by your presence. We don't want to be naive about the complications of life, but we pray, Lord Jesus, that this principle of looking to you in every situation and trusting you with every situation and obeying you on the basis of that trust will increasingly characterize our lives and our experience of God. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. I have always loved the quote, courage is not the absence of fear, but the decision to do what is right, even in the presence of fear. David certainly faced and used courage on a number of occasions, but certainly none more than when he faced the giant Goliath. Does that resonate with you? Everyone's going to feel fear mm. in their lifetime. It's completely natural human emotion. Um, and the idea that somehow when you're being courageous, you're not also afraid at the same time is, is not right. true. It's, it's what you do with that fear and are you able to overcome it? Mm. I think certainly in modern media, you see this image of courage that seemingly has no fears, but it's not true. 
no matter what, on the inside, you're feeling a certain amount of hesitancy or fear that can hold you back. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a time in your life when you faced a difficult situation with, with courage? I have quite a specific one. Um, about five years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. And uh, it's when you get a cancer diagnosis, it's extremely terrifying. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you are facing fear every day. Um, but it was absolutely a time when I was given courage by God. Mm. So there was not the absence of fear, but I, I felt the strength and the courage that comes from God. Mm -hmm. I think for me, 16 years prior to being a pastor, I worked in uh, low-income government housing communities that were filled with guns and, and gangs and criminal activity. And there were a few moments, I remember one time in particular, I was walking through a neighborhood and turned a corner and there was about 10 guys who were a part of the local gang that were just standing there hanging out on the block. And immediately fear filled me because I was alone after dropping some kids off and uh, just knew that I couldn't turn around and walk away without looking suspicious. So just walked up to them. As I was walking towards them, I sent up a quick prayer to God and just said, protect me in this situation and said hello to them. And they thought I was a police officer. So wow. that helped me maneuver through that situation. But it was a, a definite moment of just trusting in God as you were walking into a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. let's, let's compare um, Saul and David for a moment. Um, they were both chosen by God. They were both anointed by the Holy Spirit. They both experienced intimacy with God. But we can see as the story unfolds that they respond and react to things very, very differently. Well, I think what you see with Saul is God has anointed him to be the king, but when the pressure's on and when he has to wait on God, there's this desire in him to take things into his own hands. Mm. And the reverse is true with David. When the pressure's on, if anything, he's bowing on his knees, he's praying, he's seeking God. So it all depends on how we react when that pressure comes upon us. Do we run to our own resources to try and solve whatever we're facing? Or do we depend on God in the midst of it? I think um, one of Saul's issues was that he was always concerned about how he came across and his own position. Um, and that was one of the reasons he was so afraid. He was afraid of losing that position or being seen to be weak. Whereas David was always concerned about God and God's honor. Mm. So for us, it's trying to get our eyes off our own circumstances and what might happen or how somebody might perceive us and just be clear about is this something that I need to say to defend God or mm -hmm. to stand up for his honor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to echo what Jenny's saying, David lived by God's resources. He didn't try and do things himself. Whenever he was facing difficult decisions or trials or tests, he would, because he had cultivated a life of prayer, away from the public eye, when he stepped into the public eye, that was already pre-existing. So he wasn't concerned with what others thought, he was just concerned with what God wanted. And he lived by faith in God's resources, not his own. Mm -hmm. What do you think the relationship is between courage and faithfulness? I think in my experience, um, I'm not sure that it ever is crystal clear. Mm. Um, it always sounds like that in hindsight when yes. you're describing how yeah. God led you to here, but in the actual moment, it, it really isn't that clear. Mm -hmm. But I think you have a sense of peace. You, you can see that there's no red lights, you know, it's, if it's not against scripture or, you know, you've had nobody say, nobody's come to you and said, don't do this. I don't think it's an exact science, um, but you do have to have courage just to start moving sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our circumstances can seem impossible, kind of like a young boy defeating a warrior giant, perhaps. But let me remind you that God is bigger than any obstacle you are facing. If you learn to trust him in the little things, then you'll be able to trust him in the big things. Thank you both for sharing today. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate your... A courageous heart is a faithful heart. 
We want to face our fears knowing that we have a God who is for us, not against us. If He has asked us to do something, He will provide the resources to do it. Let's have some faith in that and take some risks. We don't want to be sitting on the sidelines waiting for someone else to come and defend God, or even worse, criticizing those who do step up. We can be bold like King David, looking to God in every situation and trusting Him with the outcome. Join us next time for more Living Truth. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcasts. You can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. Next week, more clear biblical teaching from Charles Price. This is Living Truth. Your generous contributions support the work of Living Truth, the media ministry of the People's Church Toronto. We are committed to the highest level of transparency and accountability. If any approved project target has been met, the remaining contributions will be used where most needed as determined by Living Truth.